on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program James Risen, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporter with the New York Times. Author, his latest is Pay Any Price, Greed, Power, and Endless War. Welcome uh, to the program, James. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, obviously, um, and I think uh, hopefully people are familiar with uh, your situation uh, legally and, and the, the, the six-year pursuit now of um, uh, and your involvement in a... Um, uh, a, a national security case. Uh, I, I want to get to that, but but I want to start uh, first with your your book because uh, what what has struck me, and we've spoken on this program uh, to Thomas Drake and and other whistleblowers, and it mm-hmm. was in my conversation with Thomas Drake that uh, this this idea, which you've really explored, I think, in this book, of 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 what uh, how the national security apparatus is abused, and it. And it seems to me, and I think your book basically uh, follows this, there is a spectrum uh, when we talk about the national security state running from thieves to con men to sort of kickbacks and then profiteering, then career ambition, and then that takes us up to keeping us safe. <laughs> Uh, right. And, and then right. maybe on the other side of that is whistleblowers, which circle back around at the beginning. So, right. So, so right. Let, let, let's talk about let's start with uh, on that spectrum of thieves. One of the things I mean, overall, your book is about what has really happened, really what has happened under the guise of the war on terror that has lasted now 13 years. Uh, let, let's start with thieves, because one of the things you cover in your book is just this amazing story of uh, that, that starts at, uh, in, in the New York area with pallets of $100 bills, shrink-wrapped. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, in that case, um, the U.S. government, the Bush administration, right after uh, uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, decided to send about $14 billion in cash to uh, Iraq from the United States, from the New York Federal Reserve uh, uh, East Rutherford cash currency facility, and they had uh, convoys of trucks, went down the New Jersey Turnpike from East Rutherford and uh, loaded loaded all the cash into C-17 Air Force, C-17s at Enders Air Force Base, Flew it to uh, Baghdad International Airport, and then a lot of it disappeared after it arrived in Baghdad. Now this and, is uh, this is above and, and beyond the story of the duffel bags, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is uh, industrial scale thievery, uh, where you know billions of dollars in cash on pallets sent from uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York just disappeared. And uh, what we found, what I found in the book, was that there had been a secret investigation that had identified uh, a bunker in Lebanon where nearly two billion of that was uh, identified and has uh, been hidden by the people who stole it from uh, Baghdad. And so we know there's this bunker there with two billion dollars in in, uh, stolen cash. What happens then? Well, the uh, Special Inspector General for Iraq, Stuart Bowen, uh, who investigated this, tried to get other people in the U.S. government to do something about it. Nobody wanted to go after it. Nobody cared. By the time he discovered this bunker, the Obama administration was already in place, and they, everybody by that time just wanted to forget about Iraq. And uh, the Iraqi government knew about it, too. Uh, Prime Minister Maliki talked to Bowen about it, and uh, they never went after it. And it's clear that there were some powerful Iraqis and powerful Lebanese uh, money launderers who were behind this, and nobody really wants to rock the boat and and uh, to make the effort to go get the money. And, and I mean, that two billion is 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 just the tip of the iceberg of the money that is gone. I mean, first off, whose money was it? What was the theory behind this? Um, and and where do you think the rest of it is? Well, then the theory was this was this was uh, money from Iraqi government accounts uh, in the United States uh, that had been frozen or had been built up uh, to hold Iraqi uh, oil revenues from Iraqi oil sales, and so uh, it was the 
CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, which was created right after the invasion uh, and was run by Paul Bremer and the Bush administration, decided they needed all this cash to jumpstart the Iraqi economy. But they just flew it all over there in huge Air Force transport planes and then uh, drove it down Root Irish in Baghdad to this uh, green zone and then it largely disappeared. Uh, and there was virtually no accounting, no record keeping, no nothing, and no oversight. And since it was not U.S. taxpayer money, uh, nobody in the uh, Congress really cared about it. Uh, and the, really, the only person in the U.S. government who cared about it was Stuart Bowen, the uh, Special Inspector General. And he pursued this for years. And where you know, I, I mean, when you, when you speak to him, I mean, what is what, what what is his perspective on all this? I mean, that's that's just sort of fascinating. There's a couple of figures uh, in your book, and and, and we're going to talk about them in, in a moment. But I I just wonder, you know, for those people who have this perspective, and I think mm-hmm. you know these types of people we're seeing, you know, uh, maybe. We're just more conscious of them, maybe, because I would even, you know, I would say the the long line of whistleblowers we have, these people who mm-hmm. sort of become disillusioned uh, and, right, right. And, and just see like, you know, wow, there's just no, you know, all. Well, you know, the, what I think I tried to show that in the book is that, you know, after 13 years of of the war on terror, we've, you know, gone from what might you might have called a search for justice in the beginning to today it's a search for cash and power and we've created a mercenary class of people who now make a career off the war on terror they want to make get rich or they want to get uh, ahead in the government or they want status and power and that's what endless war does to you, does to a society is it creates a mercenary class that feeds off of uh, war and it helps this, you know, vicious cycle of making sure that we never, uh, never get out of a period of war. Um, one, one figure who also uh, stuck out as we move from sort of, I guess, thieves into con men uh, uh-huh. is is Dennis Montgomery, and right. this character, you know, uh, a buddy of mine wrote a book about Sam Israel, who was the uh-huh. the hedge fund, uh, con- and and the, the sort of the, the parallels here. You know, mm-hmm. between the financial sector and mm-hmm. this, um, I guess, industry, if you want to call it, um, uh-huh. you know, there's just so much money floating around. Right. And yeah. I mean, go, go ahead. That was one of the things that that I tried. That kind of the what I tried to look at was how you know when Dick Cheney said the gloves come off right after 9/11, what that really meant was we were deregulating national security, and at this and so all the rules came off. And all the rules came off at the same time. We poured hundreds of billions of dollars into counterterrorism. And so you had a deregulated national security apparatus in which we were pouring hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And so you had enormous unintended consequences. In my opinion, it's kind of like the banking. We had a national security crisis, kind of like the banking crisis. And you just, everybody realized there was a gold rush going on in Washington. If you wanted to get rich, uh, go to Washington and call yourself a counterterrorism expert. And that's what Dennis Montgomery did. And, uh, well, t- tell us about him. Well, he's just a fascinating character. Uh, he was a self-styled, he, he says he was a uh, computer expert, and he created a company, you know, a technology that he said would allow him to detect uh, objects on um, uh, the video of um, Al Jazeera news broadcasts. And he claimed that he had the ability to find inside uh, the the um, banner on an Al Jazeera newscast, he could find the identity of, or he could find numbers and codes. And working with the CIA, he, he gave the CIA information that he claimed showed that there were uh, a whole series of numbers hidden inside Al Jazeera newscasts that the CIA took to mean uh, a series of flights that were going to be attacked by Al Qaeda. And in the Christmas time, 2003, the CIA took this so seriously that President Bush 
ordered a whole series of flights, international flights to the United States grounded based on what Montgomery was telling the CIA. And the flight, some of the flights were from France, and the French intelligence didn't think this was very funny. And so they demanded that the CIA tell them what kind of source or what kind of information they were getting. And after the CIA finally told the French where they were getting this information, the French intelligence got a French tech firm to look at this. And they came back and said, this is a hoax. And uh, finally, after a while, the CIA was convinced it was a hoax. And instead of uh, admitting they made a mistake, they just covered up the whole thing and uh, never talked about it for years. It, 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 and and wasn't it the case, too, that, I mean, this company, he formed a company, right? That, right, that, right, yeah. That, that, right. Um, that um, via Dick Cheney got is sort of like passed around like there was the air force was still into this technology yeah. well after that yeah yeah that's the amazing thing is that even after the cia became convinced that this was a hoax uh he got contracts with the military and even into the beginning of the obama administration and um you know in uh there's some evidence that in 2009, if you remember, there was a, a supposed threat from Somali terrorists against uh, Barack Obama's inauguration. And, um, you know, there was some evidence that this, uh, it, it turned out to be a, a, a hoax. And um, there's been some evidence that that may have come from, uh, or, or Montgomery may have played some role in that, uh, in that incident, too. And, and so it, it's something that's gone on for a year. I mean, it went on for a long time. And wasn't it the case that uh, that that uh, George Bush contemplated bombing Al Jazeera because of this information? Well, what what they considered was uh, shooting down airplanes over the Atlantic. Um, there was a meeting that was described that I describe in the book uh, between uh, at the White House um, in the week after Christmas, two thousand three, where a top White House official discussed uh, whether they should shoot down planes uh, that are uh, coming to the United States based on this information. Luckily, that never happened. Uh, but that that was the level at which you know this was being taken very seriously. But didn't anybody at the CIA say, hey, you know what, um, this is an interesting story you're telling us, and but uh, maybe we should just double-check this with some other firm? I mean, this just seems like... I mean, well, thank that's goodness. one of the that's way that's one of the ways in which secrecy really can be uh, leads to abuses. Where if you keep everything secret, uh, then no one knows. Then very few people know about it. And I think that was one of the cases here. It was kind of a case where only a very small handful of people were read in on this program, and so and all, only those who kind of accepted the basic premise of it were were allowed to know about it. And because you kept kept the information about it so small, all, you, all people knew was the CIA has information about possible threats, and that nobody, or very few people knew where it was coming from. So very few people could question it. So how does that work from a bureaucratic standpoint? Like uh, Montgomery approaches somebody he knows in the CIA through probably some intermediary. I've got well, this it was, it was a very it's a very complex uh, set of relationships that led to him getting in with the CIA. Um, and I detail those in the book. It takes a, it's a very complicated, uh, and it goes through a lot of different people. Uh, and I think it was because of those relationships that uh, he was taken seriously. It led, you know, through uh, con- Congress and through lobbying firms, and it was just a whole series of of people who, you know, who worked with him for at different points. Um, but and and he even got a meeting with in Cheney's office uh, when he was trying to get more contracts. And what what do you think drives? I mean, because I've I've had some experience um, uh, in the early days of Air America, uh, mm-hmm. w- which was founded uh, with all due respect by a con man, uh, and it is interesting to see like, you know, where uh, w- w- the type of people who enable that person. In other mm-hmm. words, you know, they have an agenda, too, and a con man usually comes in with answers that uh, provide it. I mean, because I'm trying to cover this spectrum of, of, of what has been created by this sort of 
just pile of dumb money, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, that well, that's what I think. I think that's the basic problem here is we had, as I said, the U.S. decided we panicked after 9-11 and we decided, you know, we're going to pour money at this problem of terrorism at an unprecedented level. And so we were basically throwing money at the CIA and the FBI and creating new in agencies like Homeland Security and just giving them hundreds of billions of dollars, and it was more money than they knew what to do with. And so they were trying everything, and uh, it was it was really crazy. And they they really didn't have much. They didn't put much thought or didn't have much oversight. Nobody wanted, you know. And st it's still true today that no one wants to do serious oversight of counterterrorism because if you criticize them, you're considered soft on terrorism. And, and in some ways, it goes it goes deeper. I mean, this is the sort of the, the dynamic with with Thomas Drake in some fashion mm -hmm. is right. uh, his whistleblowing was really more whistleblowing, not so much that something was happening that was um, uh, unconstitutional, although there was some you mm -hmm. know elements. But it was really like this is a huge waste of money. This is just corruption. Right. 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 And that's one of the things, like, that's kind of what I'm talking about, is that by keeping everything secret, you en enable these, um, you know, programs to continue without any question. And that's when when I talk about the war on whistleblowers in the book, I, that's really kind of what the end result uh, of the crackdown on leaks is, is that you allow, you make sure that there is no oversight by suppressing the truth and by making sure everyone is afraid to uh, ever uh, raise any uh, questions about uh, anything. And so when uh, Drake and Diane Rourke, another whistleblower that I profile in the book, uh, you know, when they try to raise questions, they get persecuted and the FBI raids their houses. Uh, and, and let's just put a coda on Dennis Montgomery. Uh, I know people are wondering, like, well, OK, this guy uh, built the U.S. government out of millions of dollars, almost um, had a shooting down our own planes. What jail is he in? He's not. He's he's uh, he's he's not in jail at all. He's never prosecuted for that. He was, uh, as I said, he got contracts for a long time. The, the ultimate irony is I think that he the only prosecution I think he was subject to was some type of. Uh, card counting scheme in Vegas or something, right? Well, he had some uh, gambling bills. That, oh, that's uh, it. Fraudulent checks, I think it was now. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, so tell us uh, about a Larbus. Well, that's a fascinating story where um, it was a covert action operation with uh, Special Operations Command in the Pentagon in which um, they set up a fall a a uh, fake company to provide, supposedly to provide intelligence for uh, the Pentagon uh, in the Middle East. And um, what I found was that one of the people being used in this operation was a Palestinian who uh, told some other Americans involved in the operation that he wanted to find a way to launder hundreds of millions of dollars, and in one case told one of the Americans involved that he wanted to use the bank account set up by, for this covert action to launder as much as $300 million. And um, then I eventually found out that the FBI was conducting an investigation of uh, this operation, and the allegations, uh, they'd heard some of the same allegations. And I had a very weird meeting with the FBI where um, they agreed to come in and let me talk to them about what I had heard. And also, in, in exchange, they were supposed to tell me, you know, kind of as a trade barter, some information back and forth about what both of us had heard about this uh, operation, because it was so secret, nobody knew about it. Uh, and I go into this windowless conference room at the Hoover building, the FBI headquarters, to talk about their investigation and what I've found. And I start talking about what I've found about this operation and this money laundering uh, allegations. And after I finish, you know, I'd been told that they would be willing to tell me what they knew. And they all just stare at me. It's like seven FBI agents who wouldn't give me their names just stare at me and say nothing. And then I keep talking for a while, and then I look up again, and 
ask them a question and they all just stare at me and don't say a word. And uh, it was one of the most bizarre meetings or interviews I've ever had inside the government. And it convinced me. And I later found out they I was I later had it confirmed that they were conducting an investigation. But it just showed me how sensitive and difficult it was for the government to investigate these kind of uh, secret operations. Just because they were terrified of, of discussing the thing. I think so. Or do you think it's possible they didn't even know what you were talking about? I mean, on some, no. like, like I, I, on some level, I imagine like they're just saying they're going in for a completely different program. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I was later told by someone that that, was, that meeting became legendary within the FBI. <laughs> just because but of the amount a... of information they didn't have? No, no, no. They, they just didn't want to tell me what they were doing. And I later had to confirm that they were... Uh, investigating the same thing, and they just had decided they weren't going to confirm what I knew and weren't going to uh, respond to me. Um, it was just a very weird, weird meeting. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, Diane Rourke, because this is a, a, another, this is a, a, a whistleblower that I had not um, uh, really heard of uh, right, uh, right. Uh, uh, until your book, and, and it's a, it's another fascinating story of someone who you know, realizes not just the emperor has no clothes, but there's there's a lot of naked people. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think she is. Uh, she's kind of one of my heroes. She was. She really tried to blow the whistle inside the government. Never went to. Never leaked to the press. Well, tell us who she, to, who she. Who she. she yeah, was. Diane was. Diane was the House Intelligence Committee staffer in charge of oversight of the NSA at the time of nine eleven. And she was a Republican staffer. And she had worked in the Reagan White House and uh, then had gone to the Hill. And um, she was told by some people inside the NSA right after 9-11 about the fact that the NSA had started a secret domestic spying program, and um, which we now know as the, you know, the broad domestic surveillance operations. And um, she went she figured that the, at first that this was a rogue operation, that it couldn't be uh, approved by anybody. And so she went to the chairman of the, the went to the staff director of the, of the House Intelligence Committee and the ranking minority staff director and told them about it because she wanted the chairman and the ranking member to know about it. And they came back after she told them about it and told her, don't ever talk about this again. And then she realized that the chairman already knew and the ranking member already knew and that they were keeping it quiet from everyone. And then she started going around to other people she knew in the government, um, top CIA officials and people at the White House and people uh, you know, in other parts of the government. And she found that all these very senior people who she thought would help her secretly already knew about the program and were keeping quiet about it. And she got very depressed, and she finally had the mo a very dramatic showdown with NSA Director Michael Hayden, um, in which she went to see Hayden at his office and told her, told him, you know, this is illegal. And um, he basically uh, told her, well, we have the power to do this. And uh, he said to her, in kind of chilling form, says, we can get the majority of nine if we need it. And she took that to mean uh, if it goes to the Supreme Court, we'll have majority on the Supreme Court in our favor. And so she then left and tried to get to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, William Rehnquist. And um, she sent a note through uh, some family friend and never heard back, and she became very depressed and quit the government and retired. And then a few years later, when uh, our story in the New York Times came out disclosing the existence of uh, the program, uh, she became the prime suspect inside the government of who had leaked. And uh, her house was raided by the FBI, and she was persecuted, even though she had never talked to the press. And and I mean, do you are you, you th that part about the nine justices is one of the most chilling things um, uh, right. I can imagine. Right. I mean, that 
sort of granular. Like there's going to be six of us who decide right. this is legal. I'm right. one of them, says Hayden, and the other five are uh, these Supreme Court justices. Uh, right. Wh- have you talked to her? I mean, like, what? Where is she now? Why? Why is she uh, continues to to? It seems to me not tell her story, or has she told it through you now? Yeah. Well, she's very shy. Uh, she never wanted to talk very much. Now, you know, I think I was. I think this is the first time her story has really been fully told. Um, part of the problem is just simply she lives in rural, she lives out in Oregon now and she lives a very quiet life. So, you know, a lot of reporters don't track her down. Um, but, uh, cause she just wanted to get away from everything. And in fact, but she, to, go ahead. to me, I mean, she was like, there was a whole group of people, as you mentioned, Tom Drake and others who at, from the NSA who were, uh, who were persecuted. And I think her story is one that uh, is kind of a perfect example in my mind of someone who tried to blow the whistle the right way, that the way the government says you should blow the whistle, you know, which is to stay within the system. And she still got persecuted. And so to me, it kind of says to all those people, if you think Edward Snowden could have stayed here and did what he did, well, they should look at what happened to Diane Rourke. Right. And 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 let's talk about that because Thomas Drake, in some respects, too, or you 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 I think speculate that that much of the um, uh, I don't know what to call it the the persecution, uh, 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 if not prosecution of Thomas Drake, was a function of a belief that uh, he was your source as well. Yeah, that's not speculation. That's a fact. The, I got the search warrant that the FBI used uh, in the raids of those houses of all those people. And uh, they identify, they say this is, uh, this is part of an investigation into who leaked to uh, the New York Times for their stories on uh, the NSA by James Risen and Eric Lishwell. It says it on the search warrant. And what's fascinating, though, is that In fact, the case that you're dealing with now, and I'd like to, if you don't mind, to talk about that a little bit now, because I don't know that people are fully aware that despite the fact that that was the sort of the most renowned story of that era, the Mm -hmm. the, the, and and I uh, hopefully people know that this is a story that was essentially, I mean, is it fair to say is suppressed by The New York Times on multiple occasions, and they only decided to run it when you basically said, I'm putting in my book. Uh, and they basically said at that point, well, I guess the cat's going to be out of the bag. We might as well get a couple of, uh, we may be able to sell some papers out of it. Um, but that NSA story, the story of the warrantless wiretapping, is not what you're being uh, prosecuted for now. Right, right. Well, I'm not being prosecuted. I've just been subpoenaed in a criminal case. Um but, uh, you it's know, a case always, where you you re- refuse to to reveal right. uh, your source and could right. very well go to job uh, to jail for it. But, right, right. Well, right. tell yeah, us I what mean, that I think, case. I've is. always thought I've always thought that the real reason they were doing that is because they were upset at, at the NSA story and that they just were looking for other things to uh, to come after me on. I, I think they decided the government decided not to come after the New York Times. Uh, on the NSA story, because that was would have led to a real major constitutional showdown with uh, the New York Times, and I think they didn't want to do that. And uh, so I think they looked for other things that were just in my book and not in the New York Times. And 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 they they basically settled on uh, Merlin. Yeah, I know that they investigated several chapters in my book. Um, the FBI uh, questioned any number of people about several aspects of the book and then settled on one chapter one, uh, about uh, CIA, a flawed CIA operation in Iran uh, in which uh, the uh, U.S., the CIA tried to give flawed nuclear blueprints to Iran but uh, in hopes of trying to derail the Iranian nuclear program, but the Russian defector they used to give them to the Iranians immediately saw that they were flawed, and he warned the Iranians that they were flawed, so that uh, they were tipped off about the whole program. And so, ostensibly, like, what is I mean, what is the concern there? I mean, 
I mean, what what the 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 primary case here uh, that I guess it's who leaked that information to you? I mean, what damage is there to national security to report what the Iranians already know? Oh, well, I don't think that in the whole history of the war on terror that there's been a single news story that's harmed national security. And I think that's the government cries wolf about these things all the time. They never show any damage. I mean, if you think about it, we're like the only superpower in the country and they seem to be worried about a few reporters and uh, it's just uh, really kind of ridiculous to think that this can harm national security. You know, any kind of news story can harm national security of a, the world's only superpower. I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, you know, and I guess maybe I already know the answer, uh, and it's it's embedded in your book. But what, what, how do you divide up the, uh, I guess the, the the agendas that drive that belief? In other words, how much of it is uh, sincere? How much of it is I want to make sure that people don't realize I'm involved in thievery or incompetence or I mean because that I think is you know I think that's the part of the story and I and I know your book mm-hmm. you know addresses that but I think that's mm-hmm. the part of the story the people that is the most in some ways the most accessible because everybody who works at any type of big corporation or even small corporation sees this on a daily basis sure well, Jim that's a good blew way to put it, it and so imagine, it's, imagine you know where whatever company you work at and imagine that everything in the entire company is secret from everybody else in that company, and that only uh, like five people know about any particular thing going on. Imagine how screwed up the company would become because of all the abuse and waste and fraud that would happen if everything, if no one, not even people in the building, and no one, certainly no one outside, could ever know anything. That's a recipe for abuse, and that's what's happened. Uh, people have have used secrecy to cover up embarrassments and mistakes and uh, errors in judgment and thievery and fraud. And, uh, and I mean, it's almost, it's, it's almost a self-reinforcing loop, right? We've got to keep it secret yeah, yeah. because and you of can the always say and the secrecy you can always say creates it's in the more. Name of, yeah, you can always say it's in the, in the name of national security, uh, that no one can know what I do because I'm really important. And, and and lastly, uh, uh, just put into context for us, as you, I mean, uh, to so that people understand why you are uh, willing to go to jail to protect the source. I mean, the importance of the type of reporting that uh, you and uh, others like you do, and 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 why that principle of protecting the source is so important to that job. Well, I think it's the only way to. Um continue to do aggressive investigative reporting. You, you got to have uh, reporters need the confidentiality of sources in order to continue to do aggressive investigative reporting. And if we don't have that in our society, then, um, you know, we'll have more abuse, more corruption, uh, and far less transparency. And so I think it's really vital. Do you think the American public has less of appreciation uh, than they used to of that dynamic? Yeah, probably. Um, it's not. It there's not much of a constituency for uh, the press or the media. People hate the media, um, so it's it, we're an easy target. And uh, but you know, I think they might miss it if we were gone. Yeah, uh, indeed. I'm just curious as to what do you think has changed in society that they're not, um, that, you know, you, uh, today's Dustin Hoffman is not playing you in a, uh, <laughs> in a film. Hey, I think the, well, you know, we brought that on ourselves. There's a lot of things to hate about the media today. So, uh, you know, you look at the tabloid nature of most media, and it's uh, pretty ugly, so... I, I can't defend <laughs> can't defend all the media either. So, um, but you know, with the bad, you got to remember that people still do reporting that's important, and um, and so there's a lot of really good reporters out there that 
need protections like this. James Risen, the book is Pay Any Price, Greed, Power, and Endless War. We'll put a link to it, of course, at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today, and thank you so much for the work that you've been doing um, uh, as as a reporter. So much of, of, of what I have been talking about over the uh, the past 10 some odd years is um, is is directly a function of your willing to do this type of work and and, and willing and, and, and to have this level of dedication towards it and so I thank you both I guess professionally and as a citizen oh thanks very much I appreciate that